Hello, welcome to another Cosmology Talk. This week we have Amanda Weltman, who is a professor and research chair at the University of Cape Town. Uh, as with most of our speakers, she's an expert on a lot of things. Uh, one thing she's an expert on, which she's not talking about this week, is uh, the chameleon model and, uh, and screening mechanisms. I think she was uh, one of, if not the first person to, um, to talk about that in the context of, of dark energy. We heard about that last week and how uh, atomic experiments have mostly ruled it out. I think Amanda might want to say something about that before she talks about uh, what she's mainly talking about today, which is the cosmological applications of fast radio bursts or FRBs. She actually spoke about this um, a few weeks ago at a, an online conference that I was running and the talk she gave there was very interesting and generated a lot of interest at the conference too. So I, I thought it would be good to get her to come and um, speak about it in a bit more detail here. Yeah, thanks for, for coming, Amanda. Do you wanna talk about uh, what it is that, uh, fast radio bursts can do for cosmology and maybe chameleons very briefly if you want to as well. Sure. So I, I won't dive too much into chameleons because I think um, you, you would struggle to stop me, but um, I think it's really, really important that we build theories that can be ruled out. And so I'm excited about all the experiments that are being done to rule out parts of the chameleon phase space. This, the most natural parts and the original theory is still alive. Yeah. Um, both from the, the experiments you can build in the lab point of view and also from the gravitational waves from black holes point of view. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, those observations have ruled out a lot of alternative dark energy theories. So as long as they survive, we should still keep trying to rule them out. Yeah. Um, but we should also do other things, which is why I'm excited today to talk about something completely different, which is, right. you know, what, what can we learn from fast radio bursts and what can we learn from doing cosmology with them? So is, is, there a, is there a brief summary you can make of, um, of what fast radio bursts are and, and why on earth they'd be useful for, for cosmology? So as you know, is hinted by the fast and the radio, they're uh, transient bursts. So um, very brief, so within around the millisecond range, although there's some that are sort of seen in the microsecond range. And this is also where we have looked. So it's possible that they, uh, you see them in, in different ranges. We see them in the radio. Originally, the, the range of radio that they were observed was also relatively narrow. That's now got a lot broader, okay. you know, around a couple, of, a couple hundred megahertz, all the way up to several gigahertz. And um, we've seen relatively few of them. Uh, you know, the, we, the first we observed was 2007. And over time, more were found looking in archival data. More have been found looking intentionally. And we've gone from having a few to now having a few hundred, which is still relatively few. We, we should be seeing thousands, tens of thousands of them in the coming years. Okay. So that's sort of what they are. Um, I think I have another slide later on with like little bits of details of what we think we know. All right. um, what I think makes them really interesting is to, to me personally is two things. One, we don't fully understand the physics behind them. Right. So they're just this, this really fascinating astrophysics puzzle. And if you're someone who loves to solve puzzles, hmm. they present a beautiful puzzle that you can go and look for bits of evidence that tell you, well, they probably are not this, they probably are not that. Some of them at least can't be this. And so we're slowly putting together that piece, that puzzle. Hmm. And, you know, the, the, what I will tell you today is different to what I told you just two or three weeks ago, because we have new pieces. So it's really exciting to be in a field that's so fast moving. So trying to understand them is very exciting. Mm. Um, and it gives us hints about the universe in other ways. And then also, you know, cosmology is a field that is, you know, building from being completely philosophical to being really data driven, to being precision, to suddenly being in crisis. And so figuring out what are the invariants in cosmology? What do we really understand? What are good rulers? What are good ways to measure the universe on the larger scales um, hmm. gives us a handle on some of those questions in crisis. And FRBs are possibly just the spectacular tool to do that because of the way they probe matter as, as they travel through the universe. So hmm. I think for me, that's two completely different sets of interesting things about FRBs. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's, that's the, that's for me why they're, they're interesting and exciting. Cool. Um, I, I think, I, I might be able to predict what your answer will be to this question based on what you just said, but if there were two simple things you wanted people to take away from this, from this talk um, about FRBs and, and, and in general, what, what would they be? So I think that the two, the two takeaways for me would be that firstly people should work on other things. I think it's a good thing to like 
take the skills of one field and try to uh, bring them to the problems of another with, with the humility that is required when you're entering someone else's field. Mm -hmm. But I think it's kind of important to, you know, not totally silo ourselves. So I think mm -hmm. that's for me been a really wonderful thing to reach out and learn from radio astronomers so much. Yeah, and the other is, I guess, that there are just so many of these big open problems that we possibly don't know about and that are worth doing. So the, the, the messages are broader. And then I suppose there's a long list of messages from FRBs, which is that the data, that, the observations that you see, especially the early ones, are not necessarily representative. Mm -hmm. So we need to be spectacularly careful about our biases. And I think the bias in FRB uh, observations is substantial, and the observers acknowledge this. And there's a lesson there for everything else you do, which is that your, all of your experiences are a form of bias. And so I think for FRBs, that's a good takeaway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so if you want to go into more detail about um, why cosmologists should be interested in, in FRBs. Uh, sure. So I'll you take you through the slides. Let's just see. Yep. Um, there you go. So here's the list of things that we know about them. So the, the frequency range you can see there is quite broad. Uh, the radio happens to be a very wide range, but we're now seeing them, you know, in a wide range of the radio. Sorry, my German shepherd wants to join us. Um, some of them have been observed to repeat, not all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, it's currently a small fraction. So it's not even most of them. Some of them seem to have periodic repetitions. Uh, but even then, it's hard to tell because of the way you do the observations. You only observe in, in bands. It's possible that they go out to very far redshifts. This is, again, one of those things that's a bias. It's easier to see things that are closer to you because as they travel, their, their dispersion can spread and so you can miss them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we, it's easier to see the ones at low redshift. And but we do, know do that we they know are redshifts yeah. because we see optical counterparts. Otherwise, that's right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so the dispersion measure can give you some sense of the distance. Okay. Um, but it's but it's got a lot of errors in, and if it's very far out, the dispersion measure uh, is even better because the errors go down the further out it goes. Okay. But uh, an optical counterpart just pins for you the exact redshift. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are localized exactly, I'll show you a couple, are using optical counterparts. And again, it's one of those wonderful things of collaboration where you see, you know, these people in different fields all looking at the same source with so much excitement and working mm -hmm. together. So, but we do know there are at least cosmological redshifts. They're not all living within our galaxy. Okay. So they're objects that must have, you know, could have cosmological re relevance because they're, they're relatively far out, uh, you know, by which I mean like, you know, redshift up to redshift 0.5. More and more of them are getting localized. They trace their source environment brilliantly because mm -hmm. different frequency, I'll show you a video later, but different frequency components travel at different times as they go through the medium. And so they, they spread. There's a spread in frequency that tells you how much medium they've passed through. So you mm -hmm. can learn a lot about um, the universe by just, by just looking at them. Mm -hmm. The other details all really vary. You know, they have all different kinds of polarization. I think it might have been expected one day there would be only one. Mm -hmm. But it's possible that that's a propagation effect because they travel through magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that, you know, we can still learn about them. And uh, there's a lot that we can do with them. So the, the dispersion measure tells us a fortune. It's possibly the most uh, useful, useful thing to know. And you can see here that the arrival of each frequency component is, is shifted, is spread out. Um, and that's what we sort of call the dispersion measure. And it goes like one over frequency squared. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that, that sort of feature is really important. And the, if you want to figure out what is the dispersion measure sort of in physics terms, it's just the, the, inter, the integral of the density. It's the integral of the number of electrons over the column between the object and us. Okay. So the bounds of that integral is going to be source to observer. Oh, so, so that's because the, the radio wave interacts with the electrons with different kind of strengths at different frequencies. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's because there's a frequency dependence in that interaction. Mm -hmm. And so each of the, of the um, baryons between us and the object are slowing it down, mm -hmm. or slowing down the, the radio waves, basically. Mm -hmm. So if there's a large dispersion measure, you know that the distance has to be large because you're not going to have very few electrons between you and an FRB in a very short distance. So it's very intuitive. You know, it, it matches your intuitive picture of how it should be. 
Um, and it appears to be the case that FRBs all live in hosts. They're not out in the middle of nowhere. They all seem to be part of a host galaxy. It, so theories that predict FRBs clustering with matter, you know, are, are, are what you would expect. You wouldn't yeah. expect them to be lone, lone beasts in between the galaxies. And, and yeah, does that make are sense? We, are we having to make a kind of assumption that all the frequencies are emitted at the same time, that there's not some funny thing going on in the actual source that is making... Yeah, I think you have to make that assumption. Okay. I, 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 you know, it I does could, seem like I a sensible corrected. one. But a... Yes, I, you'd have to assume that they're all emitted mm. in the same moment. And I guess, you know, it's, it wouldn't be that difficult to test because looking at them coming from different regions, mm. uh, you, would be able to, you would be able to subtract out an overall contribution. So if they yeah. weren't, then I think you would see it in a different way. Yeah. So there are a bunch of implications for cosmology. I haven't there's a huge number of papers now, and I haven't included all of them. I've just included a few at different scales to give you a sense for what you can think about. Mm -hmm. And these are things other people have thought about. I apologize. I realize some of the names are going to be missing because our images may be there. But the first one is Linda et al. And basically, you know, the very early universe can be probed uh, by FRBs because they... Uh, are sensitive to the electron density all the way along that path. Mm. And so they, they would be sensitive to helium reionization. Mm. Of course, to actually do the study, to figure out what moment was helium reionization using FRBs, you need to have enough FRBs out to redshift five. Okay. So some of the cosmology you have to do is with wishful thinking FRB data sets. Right. But when I started thinking about this stuff in 2017, the, the stuff that I thought you needed and that we figured out you needed was wishful thinking to some radio astronomers and was definitely going to happen to others. Mm -hmm. So I think what is a wishful thinking data set really changes as we build these experiments. Mm -hmm. You know, FRBs were, were discovered using a change in searching strategy, not a change in technology. The leap in technology is to find more of them, but they were just found originally by, by looking at it in a different way. So, you know, lots of FRBs out to redshift five currently seems completely unrealistic, but you still have to figure out those, you know, you still have to figure out the impact of them because it may not be unrealistic in a couple of years. Mm. I'm always and reminded think, in, at yeah. moments like this of the, the original Sex Wolf paper on the CMB um, and isotropies, right. where, where I think they estimated their amplitude would be of the order 10 to the minus three, and then said, therefore, they'll never be detected. And uh, they turned out to be 10 to the minus five, and now we've obviously detected them. So uh, Exactly. And we don't even consider that to be you know, so small anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think you really, as a theorist, you really have to let yourself write as ridiculous things as you need to. I mean, the same is true of gravitational waves, right? Mm -hmm. When Einstein eventually mm -hmm. accepted that they were real mathematically, he was like, well, they're too small to ever observe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, here we are. So I think, um, you know, you know, full respect to people who write these, these papers saying, if we can get FRBs above redshift three, then we'll be able to do this, this, this. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, there, there's a whole, there's a beautiful literature building up on what you can do with, with fast radio bursts and cosmology. And of course, and it drives the technology yeah. as well, right? Like if, if, if people say, you know, get, get me an FIB about bridge of three and I'll do all this amazing stuff, it, it motivates people to build the technology. I think so. I think that's true. I think they're building them anyway because they're so excited to see them. But it, but it might drive the sense that you look for them further out mm -hmm. and that we, we check our biases when we only see them close by. We, we admit that there's a reason. And so we have to figure that out. So there's a whole bunch you can do. You know, outside the cosmology, there's also cool implications for fundamental physics, right? If, if the photon had mass, mm. I think most people uh, know already that, it, that it, the, the spread in frequency goes like one of a new squared as well. Mm -hmm. So you could confuse that dispersion measure behavior with actually just being a feature of the photon having mass. Mm -hmm. And so looking at, very, looking at specific FRBs, you can rule out... Uh, you know, photon mass as well. You can get you can get best constraints on the photon mass. The the H naught problem, which you know I think was probably one of the subjects you've also covered. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Had three so, talks in a row at one point uh, on that, and had to uh, deviate for a while. <laughs> that's but, fantastic. That's fantastic. So you know, again, there you you can you can um, improve your your distance measures mm. and get constraints that are independent of H naught, and so you know you can not necessarily resolve the H0 problem, but you can avoid the H0 problem, right? So I think there's a bunch of things you can do. You just have to be very, very careful as you're going. What are my priors? What am I assuming? 
how and and just take note of the things that are possibly super unrealistic today and, and that may change so i'm just going to do a little bit of the cosmology with you because i think it's nice to see the equations and get some intuition cool. yeah. so why I think is this one of the benefits measure? of this medium yeah. that people can pause it if they want to and uh, and work it through more carefully than a, than a live yeah, so, yeah that's definitely. true that's true that's great. So, so the, the, the references here, the one is a paper that I wrote with um, um, my PhD student at the time, Tony Walters, who really championed the work, Brian Gainsley, who's the radio astronomer who explained all the radio astronomy to us, and Yinja Ma, who's a cosmologist at, in, in Durban at the mm -hmm. University of KwaZulu-Natal, um, and also Amadeus Witzemann, sorry, he was also my PhD student at the time, is we basically wanted, we asked what seems like a crazy small question, which is, can you constrain curvature? You know, cosmologists fall in sort of different camps on this, right? Either curvature is non-existent, the universe is flat, why are we still talking about it? Yeah. That's the sort of one school of thought. And the other is, we input flatness into our assumptions secretly, and the data does not completely rule out flatness, and so we should keep omega k in there and be sure to constrain it in every way possible. Mm -hmm. And I sort of fall under the um, agnostic perspective of there's possibly curvature and we should just do everything we can to constrain it. Yeah. So our question was, you know, can you get better constraints on curvature using FRBs? And so we just looked at, you know, the, the realization is all the cosmology is sitting in that NE mm -hmm. and, and you can then go away and play with it. So it's sitting in there. If you can see in the denominator, you've got an E as a function of redshift mm -hmm. and that that involves the matter, omega matter, omega dark energy, and omega curvature. So if you want to assume dark energy is a constant, you can get constraints on that. If you want to assume it's evolving or allow it to evolve, you can get constraints on the parameters in the evolution. So we picked, you know, the, the typical equation of state to constrain. You can also then use existing constraints to get new constraints on curvature. So there's a whole bunch of uh, real physics terms in there as well, and you can see them on the left, right? So FIGM is the baryon mass fraction, which will turn out very important later on. And the amount of hydrogen and helium and how much is ionized sort of fits into that K as well. So that's sitting out in front. Do you want to just talk through the, this, this first equation so that you've got DM equals K and then... Yeah, so, the, so first of all, you've got an average DM. Yeah. right you have to average over over the sky mm -hmm. which is already you know not ideal and that's going to bring in some errors yeah you're integrating from us to the redshift of the object yeah the x over there is the fraction it's because we're talking about an electron it's the fraction of hydrogen helium and how much of it is ionized okay so okay. these are all astronomy parameters that are given to you okay the e is cosmology and which the is k the scaling on the outside, of the density of of everything right. so that the chi then scales that to specifically the ionized stuff right. right yeah okay that's right okay and then okay. the k on the outside is um how many baryons there are basically it's mm -hmm. it's like a, it's giving you the baryon number in some sense because you've got a mega baryon in there mm -hmm. you've got the planck mass which is just normalizing you and the baryon mm -hmm. mass fraction figm Mm -hmm. So to someone who's sort of newish to astro, you would just ask your astronomers, what is the baryon mass fraction? Mm -hmm. But it turns out that's going to actually be the more interesting thing to figure out. Um, and, and I'll show you that in a moment. So just, you know, the, the slide was made by Tony. Just looking at, at um, what's going on, basically you have the dispersion measure uh, contributions mm -hmm. from different parts of the observation. So mm -hmm. you've got some from our Milky Way which is relatively well known from galactic pulsars and we can just subtract that off. Mm -hmm. There's also actually a tiny bit that comes from the, the halo and th that's uh, not, I haven't really included it here. I just call that part of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's the part from the host galaxy, which is the least well known. Okay. And there's the part that's coming between. So mm -hmm. the intergalactic medium from the host to us, that's mm -hmm. where all the cosmology sits, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The part, if, if you put the host further and further away, the relative contribution of the host gets smaller, yep. right? And so your error goes down, which mm. is why you see to do good cosmology, you want lots and lots of faraway sources. Yep. Another way to do that is to have lots and lots of sources that are at the edges of their galaxies, mm. which, mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago, I was saying this and a couple of people were like, well, how realistic is that? How are we gonna find? And it turns out it's very realistic. 
which you know I'll show you in a moment. Okay. So basically, um, uh, I, I won't really belabor this because it's probably the least interesting part, but okay. not surprisingly, you can't constrain or make a baryon very well with just fast radio bursts because, well, we, we only looked out to Redshift 3, but they, they're just too, um, uh, sorry, not Omega Baryon. You can't constrain everything else very well because okay. they're most sensitive to Omega Baryon. So it's Omega Baryon that you're going to get your best constraints on. Mm -hmm. And the constraints are basically orthogonal to the, the cosmology ones, the CBSH, which is great. So that's very useful. Um, but your, your uncertainties are non-trivial. So the host galaxy is an uncertainty. And also that averaging over the IGM is an uncertainty. And so if you wanted to try and get, the, the first image over there is for a flat lambda CDM. If you mm -hmm. wanted to try and get a, a curvature constraint, the, mm -hmm. the, it's always curvature relative to omega baryon that gives you a good constraint. All the others are negligible. And again, it's, you know, in retrospect, it's not surprising because omega baryon is sensitive to the number of electrons. So it's those two parameters that you're really looking at. The and FRBs this is with there current are, FRB data that, that this is? Happening? No. Okay. No, this is a few years ago. So this is with this is with simulated FRB data. We've simulated, you know, sprinkling a thousand FRBs in a mm -hmm. redshift between zero and three mm -hmm. with a hyrax like survey. So it's not existing data, okay? Okay. Um, yeah. So the the point is here we have assumed FIGM. Mm -hmm. We looked at a number that is used in astronomy typically, and we assumed what that fraction is. We assume mm -hmm. we know that number. And what, you know, Tony really figured out, Tony Walters really figured out by looking at this and plotting and plotting and plotting is that actually FIGM is really not well known mm -hmm. and the cosmology constraints are better known. Mm -hmm. So what you really should be doing is using cosmology as your prior and inferring FIGM from the data. Right. And so basically if you do that, you're, you're solving a completely different problem. You're now no longer looking at cosmology. Mm -hmm. You're trying to figure out where are the missing baryons. Mm -hmm. So I, probably most of your viewers know about the missing baryon problem, but if they don't, it's the fact that, you know, we, we know how many baryons we think there should be based on very early universe constraints. And then somewhere between BBN and now, we seem to lose them. We mm -hmm. figure they're in the, the uh, hot gas or the warm gas intergalactic medium, but it's hard. It's, it's apparently quite hard to detect them, which, you know, admittedly was a surprise to me, but it is. And so if you allow FIGM now to be free, then you can constrain a free parameter. Then you can use your cosmology to constrain uh, what FIGM should be. Mm -hmm. And that then can solve the missing baryon problem. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, this was a very nice paper. Um, this was from last year that, yeah. that Tony really championed. And we put out last year and right. already in the last month or two, right. this is now done with an, with actual FRBs. And I think, you know, possibly to us, this was a great insight, but I think the FRB community had already realized that this would be possible, obviously. I see. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying that we changed the direction of research at all. I'm just saying that okay. we stumbled on, you know, we stumbled in some way on what was actually possibly obvious to the radio astronomers. Mm -hmm. And so this is a beautiful paper in nature. Um, that the first author is, uh, is uh, J.P. McCart. And, you know, I just wanted to pause for a moment just to, to say that, uh, you know, he's the PI on this experiment and he passed away just a couple of days ago, which is just, you know, hugely tragic, um, obviously for his family and all of his friends and colleagues. And I think also for the field of FRBs and FRB cosmology, because, you know, he, he was, a, I think, a giant who was, extremely lovely in the field and also just really a leader in these experiments so so i wanted to just take that moment to to pause and say something they put out this beautiful piece of work where basically what they do i'm going to show you this video and the link below is where i took the video from okay. so it's a popular article explaining this uh, effect so they used the four new localizations that i'm going to tell you about as well and i think some other frbs to do this but basically uh, and the the redshifts are there you can see they're all under redshift five. And then they use the, the VLT in Chile is an optical telescope. So ASCAP first observes just by looking out in the sky, um, not looking in a particular, not trying to localize it. They just see out in the sky where the, the FRBs are. And then they follow up with optical observations. 
And the overlay of the galaxies from the optical tells you exactly where they are. And so they can see exactly where they are in the galaxy, mm -hmm. which galaxy and where they are. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'll just show you this video because I just thought it's, it's for all my talking, mm -hmm. it's so much easier to see visually why um, uh, FRBs are so sensitive to matter, why they teach us about matter. So there's your FRB signal heading towards us. They're the different frequency bands, okay? You can see this is meant for a general audience, mm -hmm. but I love yeah, it, yeah. right? This is how I would explain stuff to my kids. <laughs> As it hits matter, the matter slows down different components at mm -hmm. different rates, okay? So you are sensitive to all that matter. That mm -hmm. bottom signal is telling you about the matter. Mm -hmm. And so all that intergalactic, all the baryons in the intergalactic medium that we couldn't find, so to speak, the missing matter, is found by these fast radio bursts. It's an absolutely stunning result. Mm. Absolutely stunning that, you know, maybe people knew was coming, but it, it's still a huge deal. Mm. And so I think, you know, it's sort of worth, when we wrote this paper last year, that, you know, showing theoretically that this could be done, uh, it, it hadn't occurred to me how quickly it would be done. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. it's just the rapid evolution in this field is fantastic, especially if you compare to working in fields where you may have to wait a hundred years before <laughs> something happens. So I think right. it's really exciting yeah. and a really great field for young people to, to, you know, consider. So, um, just, you know, again, I couldn't have told you about this a month ago, uh, not without, not, not unless I had inside information and was willing to be unethical, but right, this is right. a beautiful paper as well, you know, led by Bandari, but you know, a bunch of other people, there's a 2020 hidden in there. And these are the four new FRBs that ASCAP localized. Okay, so there are their four redshifts. You can see they're all in the, the you know, close range. They all sit near the edge of their host galaxies. I see. So, you know, I went to this fantastic FRB workshop um, at the Simons Institute in February. And I remember at coffee asking the different people, you know, do we know, and, and in, in my talk, I said the same thing, do we know how they spread? Do they spread like butter on toast or do they sit at the crusts? Like where, are, how are FRB spread? Mm -hmm. I don't think we necessarily know that they're all at the edge, mm -hmm. but these four seem to be at the edge. And it's possible that that's a bias in the way we observe, right? It's mm -hmm. easier to th see things that are coming from the edge rather than through the host, mm -hmm. through the whole host. Yeah. So it's possible that there's a bias going on there, but certainly this tells you that, you know, the butter exists on the crust. And I think that's, you know, very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and it, so, they get, so they get a whole lot of hints about what progenitors become unlikely. Cosmic strings become a, a bad candidate because cosmic strings should be where there's matter. So mm -hmm. you would expect cosmic strings to be anywhere in the host. They shouldn't just be at the edge. What, why would it's cosmic strings that, be where, where there is matter? Because they uh, have gravitational uh, forces. They're attracted to okay. matter the same way most stuff is, right? But, so the why, why wouldn't form, other should, things then? What other things? Well, I, I mean, uh, what makes cosmic strings special as a potential progenitor? So basically any theory that you have of FRBs has mm -hmm. to be something that clumps with matter because we see them in host galaxies. Yeah, yeah. So that's for sure. But there's no... You, I can't think of any argument that would say you would only find cosmic strings at the edge of a galaxy. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. There's nothing that would tell you they should be at the edge. Likewise, uh, supermassive black holes become in trouble because you don't expect those at the edge either. You expect those in the core of a galaxy. Okay, so maybe the interesting so question have, then is, you say at the bottom it's most likely for mergers. Why, why wouldn't you expect them to be? The so core? those can be anywhere, right? There's nothing okay. that tells you that those should only be in the center. The, so saying that the, the, re, the argument for why they're most likely from mergers is also slightly more subtle, okay. um, which is the fact that we need to understand what kind of galaxies there are. Mm -hmm. And the, there are galaxies that are not, different, not that different to ours. So they have similar masses, like 10 to the nine solar mass galaxies. They're still star forming, right? So, so, so some FRBs have been localized to very different kinds of galaxies. The famous FRB 121102 is a very different kind of galaxy and it turns out not that representative. Okay. But galaxies, neutron star mergers, neutron stars and magnetars are the same thing, right? It's just a magnetic field question. Mm -hmm. Neutron star mergers um, are more likely or happen lots in certain mass range galaxies. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, like around 10 to the 10. So these are mass range galaxies where you do expect to have lots of, of neutron star mergers. Okay. So they're okay. very much consistent with that picture, okay. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think they have a few other arguments, but 
uh, things that you would expect to only happen in the center of the galaxy, mm -hmm. like uh, supermassive black holes, are now, well, how would you explain why you would have supermassive black holes at the edge of a galaxy? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So the, the, that becomes, the, they just become harder to fit with the data. It doesn't mean that because we've seen four at the edge, all of them live at the edge. Yeah. So it's you know, just maybe I, I, is the argument essentially that there are, are so many neutron stars that there's some at the center, some at the edge, some halfway out, whereas with a supermassive black hole, there'd be only one right at the center and it's unlikely I, to be on I the edge. I think so. Okay. I think that's a reasonable argument. Um, okay. You know, I should say that like, if you talk to one of the authors of these papers, which you really should, okay. they, they would yeah. probably give you a stronger argument because sure. the cosmic string thing, I'm not fully convinced. I think there's a chance mm -hmm. that you're biased by what you can see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so if they were, if they were events from the center of the galaxy, we may just be missing them, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they may have a stronger argument that I just haven't picked up in okay. reading their paper. It's also still possible that because they're different kinds of um, host galaxies that we see them from, that each of the sources are different, that there are a mm -hmm. few sources and that wouldn't be surprising. Right. It's not, it wouldn't be surprising mm -hmm. if you have lots of different physical yeah. objects giving you fast radio bursts. Right. But certainly, uh, these sources themselves tell us that things that happen towards the edge. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really big, big, interesting result. T to sort of emphasize the importance of being able to localize the bursts, I'll tell you a tiny bit about Hyrax and what our plans are. Mm -hmm. So Hyrax is a South African-led experiment, the hydrogen intensity and real-time analysis experiment. In its full instantiation, we expect or we plan to have 1,024 six meter dishes. So you can see the, the little image at the bottom mm. in the middle is the, the artistic plan for how the dishes should look, right? So the, right. the parabolic dishes. On the right hand side, that animal is the, the hyrax, the, the rock okay. dusty. Um, and so basically hyrax is very similar to chime. It's a BAO intensity mapping experiment that has fast radio bursts as one of its science cases. Mm -hmm. But, you know, despite the fact that I'm a dark energy person at heart, I'm as excited or more, in fact, I'm, I'm more excited about the fast radio bursts than okay. the dark energy right now. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of exciting things that you can do with them. And so, um, you know, the forecasts for the constraints are sort of there. I include them just for, for uh, completeness. Okay. Um, and the name, I think, uh, is sort of worth uh, pointing out. It's not, the, it's not the thrash and destroy rock band. So here is CAT7, which is the Karoo Array Telescope, and there's seven of them. They're in the Karoo. We then made more of them, which mm -hmm. in Afrikaans is Mir Kat, yeah. Yeah. which is the animal Mir Kat. I love that yeah. astronomers do this so well. I, don't, I think in particle <laughs> physics, we don't name my experiments anywhere nearly so well. And then the rock, the rock dusty or the hyrax. not uh, exciting to you. No, right. It's like completely underwhelming. They live, they live in the same area of the Karoo as the meerkats. Mm -hmm. And so hyrax will as well. It's going to live on the SKA site. Hence the name hyrax, you know, like yeah. so cleverly thought out. All credit to my colleagues. And, you know, South Africa has made a really strong case for radio astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, we passed this act of, of government um, called the Astronomy, Ge uh, the Astronomy Geographic Advantage Act, sorry, 2007, where basically the Karoo is kept radio quiet. So a very mm. large part of the Karoo is kept radio quiet. So you can see the radio frequency interference on the right-hand side yeah, yeah. is very, very low in that 400 to 800 megahertz band. Mm. band. Mm. Okay, and that corresponds in the, in the continuing observing uh, mode which is what's useful for intensity mapping, that corresponds to the redshift range of about one to two and a half. I see. So okay. that's where you get your, that's the redshift range for, that's useful for dark energy, right? That's when mm. we expect dark energy to switch on. Mm. So it's extremely useful for that. that. That RFI is very, very low. It's also useful for fast radio bursts because we see them in this whole range, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of why. And the plan is to spread Hyrax out. So the, uh, the main array will be, in um, the Karoo, mm -hmm. but there will be outriggers. So an outrigger is just a set of eight little telescopes together okay. in, in, you know, partner African countries and in mm -hmm. other parts of South Africa. Right. And what that means is that instead of having, instead <laughs> of having the dish size limited by the main array, 
it's as if you have a dish the size of, you know, the bottom part of Africa or as, right. as big as your longest distance. And mm. so that is spectacular for localizing FRPs. Mm. You know, you can get sub arc second resolution, which means instead of saying it's probably in this galaxy, you can say where it is in a galaxy. And now this is what ASCAP are doing, right? So this is exactly where the field is going. And so um, that's ideal for cosmology. It's ideal for figuring out the physics behind them. And it's really the direction of the field. And so, you know, this is, this is what Hyrax um, is building at the moment. And that's really our plans and, and why. Um, and then sort of, you know, the lessons you asked me for two, I've got a whole bunch up there. Yeah. Um, and I, I, th I think it's just important to realize also that you don't necessarily have to have major revolutions in your technology. And that so much can be done, and I mean this outside of astronomy, so much can be done by just changing the way you look at your data. Hmm. Um, and so that, that's why that was possibly my biggest uh, takeaway. The, the next question I would, would have asked is just um, where, where to next, I guess, building Hyrex is one thing, but as a theoretical cosmologist, where, where would you be looking I think, next? So I think, we need to, I think we need to figure out all the things that, that FRBs can tell us. We need to ask all those questions and um, make as many predictions mm. and ways to rule out things as possible before the data comes. The data is mm. going to come like a flood and we're not going to be able to, you know, deal with it. But I think if you want to make really solid science, you have to make the predictions before the data. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I think the, the way to from here is to say, well, you know, first of all, what, how can we use them for cosmology? So that when you have the data, it's very simple to then just take that data and um, uh, you know, and, and con make your conclusions. And the other is if you, if you want to, you know, play the game of trying to explain them, mm -hmm. you need to do that in advance. You need to say, well, this is what is driving them. And, um, you know, and this is how you could rule it out. Yeah. And, you know, we, I, I didn't mention this at all, uh, though I probably should have, which is that, uh, my group of students really worked very hard to put together this FRB theory catalog. Mm -hmm. And we did it as a way to learn what are all the, th the existing theories. We wrote this catalog at a time when there were a similar number of theories to observations. There were about 47, I think. Okay. And within a couple of weeks, there suddenly were many, many more. Mm. And so that catalog is up there and it gives all the different ways to rule out each theory, which is great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see this observation and this theory is toast. You see this observation and this theory is in trouble. And so we've tried to make a very clear way of understanding all the theories to make it easy for people to enter the field um, and to make it also easy for people to talk to each other about things. So it's yeah, a wiki I'll provide that a link to this, to this wiki. Yeah. It's sure. a, so, so it's a, it's a wiki that, that you've made of all the theories of, um, of what That's might right. be the source of an FRB. Yeah. Right. Um, I remember at this, at this conference, we discussed you, me and, and others, uh, the possibility yeah. of having a general cosmology wiki. So uh, once, once right. I have a bit of spare time, I will start, um, getting that group together. So if anyone listening to this wants to be involved in that group, uh, leave a comment or get in touch. Um, but back to that question about the cosmology that one can do with FRBs. You were saying, you know, the, the, the community should get together and um, work out what all the things are. Just on, on the top of your mind, what are some of the things that, that you didn't mention in this talk that might be the things people should be looking into right away, like next? What is the, what is the low hanging fruit? Um. You know, I don't really know. I, I guess figuring out, uh, so I think there already exist some fairly good maps on what you can do with dark matter. So mm -hmm. um, the lensing that dark matter would cause and different mm -hmm. kinds of dark matter and different kinds of lensing. And I think now taking the data and comparing the observations uh, would probably give some new constraints. I think mm -hmm. that would be interesting. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that necessarily there's low hanging fruit or not, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing cross correlations with other data mm -hmm. and figuring out information about uh, the large scale features by comparing yeah. with other data, I think would also be very useful. Yeah. So I think for me, the question of how they are distributed across galaxies mm -hmm. is a key one. Okay. And if they are all sitting at the edges of their galaxies, then you can actually get very, very strong cosmology constraints because you get rid of your biggest error, mm -hmm. which is the dispersion measure from the host. So I think people can do far more speculative stuff than might have been sensible a couple of months ago. 
Mm. Now that we see, they do seem to sit near the edges of their galaxies. Mm -hmm. So I think there are those things to do. Yeah, or what you can also do is, you know, um, Tony's been been out of town for some time, sort of out of internet range. But when he gets back to Cape Town, mm -hmm. we're going to start a kind of cosmology with FRB's reading group. Okay. And, yeah. you know, anyone who's keen to join is most welcome. So, yeah, so please, anyone um, who's keen, get in touch with, with me or Amanda and I'm, I'll put you in touch with her if you get in touch with me. Yeah, I think that's a good way to sort of go about things, read about... I think it's important that people read what's already done to understand what's done. Mm -hmm. And the papers are all, you know, very well written. Mm -hmm. In my experience, it's a field that's actually quite, quite compelling to enter and then go from there. I think that's a good way to start. Yeah. So really um, just, just one more question. The, the one I ask at the end of all these talks is um, outside yes. of your own research, sure. what would you, uh, what do you think is the most interesting thing in cosmology at the moment? Oh, I was about to tell you how interesting I think uh, the Space Force is. Um, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't know if you've seen the new Netflix Space Force show. Uh, I've, I've heard of it. I haven't, I haven't actually seen it, but yeah. Yeah. So it triggered me to actually go and see like what, what's being done at NASA. Okay. Um, and I saw that they have this, this project. It's outside of cosmology. I'll answer the cosmology question in a moment. But they have this project where they're studying, you know, the effects of space travel on on living beings mm -hmm. and i think that's actually extremely cool yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah so i think there's so many interesting things that people are researching you know and i, I guess i've always found the bridging things really interesting so that's like understanding gravity understanding astrophysics mm -hmm. but also really understanding biology and being able to run a lab mm -hmm. you know run a biology lab so i think that's right. like a really nice right. um you know astrobiology yeah, yeah, is kind yeah, of very yeah. cool uh, but in terms of cosmology um you know, I, I don't know. I think uh, I think I tend to lean towards the things that are slightly alternative. So the ways of the lab tests, I think the lab tests of dark energy type theories are very good. Mm -hmm. I think possibly at the moment, the most interesting thing is bringing together all the different wavelengths mm -hmm. and, um, and the multi-messengers. So bringing together neutrinos, I've always thought neutrinos hold a whole lot of information that we're missing, yeah. Yeah. you know, trying to understand all these problems that neutrinos present. So mm. bringing together, you know, neutrinos, cosmic rays, gravitational waves, and the full optical spectrum, mm -hmm. and learning about the universe by putting together all those parts, I mm. think is going to, I think that's sort of the next wave for us in cosmology. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's my feeling, at least. Cool. And, and, and it's kind of interesting in the sense that, you know, not that long ago, you could do a lot alone. Mm -hmm. And now you cannot. I think mm -hmm. it's become a really collaborative field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, there's no, and, and that's kind of, you know, it's sort of fascinating that there's been that move. Yeah. The, you know, you can't really sit on your own as much. And the lone wolf model. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned very in, the, much, in the intro yeah. to last week's talk, which was one of these lab experiments. Um, how that's that's one of the rare exceptions that's still sort of like early 20th century science where you're testing fundamental physics in a, in a small lab in imperial college but um but you're I, right, love, I love most stuff i love those massive collaborations yeah i love those and i love the fact that you know fermilab had this experiment and grenoble uh, you know i went out to visit the grenoble experiment where they were basically doing like cold neutron it was a cold yeah. neutron experiment and basically yeah. bouncing in a gravitational well okay and basically, it's like, you know, mm. 10 people get together and build this thing. Yeah, it's yeah, completely yeah, yeah. fascinating and amazing to me that this can still be done. Yeah. But I think cosmology, it's harder. I mean, there's still obviously going to be small author papers. Mm -hmm. But with cosmology, you're going to have to figure out how do you synthesize all this data coming from different mm. sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I think the other thing that I think is very important is priors. I think mm -hmm. we've, we've absorbed our priors far too much. And I think yeah. it's biased the field. And so I think, you know, figuring out what are your prize every time you do something, what are your prize? What am I assuming mm -hmm. um, is important. And it's, it's often been a shock to me when I look at data and I'm like, oh, actually, this constraint is only subject to this prior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you sometimes have to, like you have to make the prior assumption to get the calculation done. But, but it's important to know that you made those assumptions and, and that you could have made so other assumptions. That's right. The critique is not on the prior. The critique is on the statement at the end. You yeah. know, like when you read the Planck data, it'll give you a constraint on dark energy, but mm -hmm. that is subject to an assumption about curvature mm -hmm. and the constraint on curvature is subject to an assumption about dark energy. Yeah, and yeah. if you let the two be free, 
the constraints vanish. Right. right. Um, so, you know, breaking that degeneracy is important, which, you know, we did do in a paper using actually a uh, Hyrax like survey. You can break that degeneracy. 21 mm -hmm. centimeter intensity mapping does mm -hmm. it for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, figuring out what are the prize, it just means people have to be careful. Yeah. So, yep. you know, it's kind of unfortunate that cosmology has become such a careful field. You don't yeah, get to yeah, make yeah. Broad It's not the Wild West anymore. Statements. It's not the Wild West anymore, right? <laughs> Which is possibly why I've become so interested in FRBs and other things. Cause the wild because West, they are the Wild West again. <laughs> they're the Wild West. It's more fun, right? <laughs> yeah. um, that's my feeling. I also think that, you know, I'm still interested in string cosmology, which is mm -hmm. what I originally worked on yeah, as a grad yeah. student. I, I didn't plan to work on cosmology. I learned the chameleon idea was a string theory problem. Mm -hmm. We were trying to solve the moduli stabilization problem and figure out how to give mm -hmm. moduli mass. I see. I see. Had nothing to do with cosmology. The cosmology was a, off, was a side effect. I see. I see. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I went to the US to do a string theory PhD mm -hmm. and, and, you know, worked for a string theory supervisor who happened to be moving towards cosmology. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I had wanted to study cosmology, I would have stayed in South Africa and worked with George Ellis. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. sort of the, the irony of my, uh, you know, my career trajectory. Yeah, but yeah. we landed up, but so I think string cosmology is still a very important problem, mm -hmm. which is if you think string theory is the theory that is going to eventually, you know, uh, be fundamental, then mm -hmm. you've got to figure out how cosmology emerges from it. Right, right. And if it's yeah, not yeah. the theory, then you've got to figure out which theory has cosmology as a low energy solution. Mm -hmm. And I th mm -hmm. think that is still a very important problem. I think we, we, we sweep a lot of things away with scalar fields, but they, they have to come from somewhere. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. yeah. And so to me, those are still very important problems that, you know, uh, are underlying and they may answer other really great things like the dimensionality, you know, how mm -hmm. weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Our dimensionality seems to be why we live in. in why there are three, three um, why we experience generations of particles and that sort of Three thing. generations of particles. I mean, why the mass ratios all happen to be such elegant numbers. You know, the mass uh, what ratios. Is, what is the, that? You know, the other, I, I, if I you like add that, up I, the masses. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a two thirds and a one third. If you add up the masses oh. of the neutrinos, they, they don't. Okay. And I, I think the quarks as well. Okay. There's, there's coincidences that, that <laughs> you know, are unexplained. I think there are a lot of unexplained yeah. coincidences. Um, and as I said before, I think neutrinos are still very important. Mm, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. And figuring out those sterile neutrino experiments, why we seem to keep seeing fourth generation of neutrinos that don't interact. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there are a lot of open problems still, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't, you know, despair at the fact that biology seems to be having such a huge... <laughs> exciting <laughs> time yeah cool um yeah. Sure. so thanks amanda uh thanks thanks everyone else for for watching um if you like the video please do subscribe and if you click the bell you'll get notified of new videos and um do tell your friends and colleagues about about the channel um if you have any questions or suggestions leave a comment while you're here you could you could check out another video um Amanda was mentioning these lab experiments are really um really cool last week's talk by claire Burridge was exactly on an example of one of these lab experiments. Um, and yeah, thanks again, Amanda, for a really, really interesting talk.